G'day guys, we finally got a World Eaters Codex and oh my god is there some crazy combinations and crazy powerful lists capable of being built using this book. A lot of people are complaining that this book is a little one dimensional, there's not a lot of different options, but I'm here to show you that they are wrong by presenting my top 8 picks for different World Eaters lists that you can expect to see across the tabletop at your next tournament. So with that being said, let's get stuck into the lists. Alrighty, this first list I call Rhino Rush, and it's something that World Eaters players have fantasized about for years, just running a whole ton of rhinos with berserkers inside them and bum rushing across the table. So let's have a look at the list. Alright, so we've got an Arcs of Omen detachment. We've got the Lord Invocatus for 160 points. Then we've got two units of 10 Corn Berserkers. One of them has got two Eviscerators and three Plasma Pistols, and the other one's just got the two Eviscerators, the Berserker icon on both. Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units of Corn Berserkers, all five man units with an Eviscerator in each and a Berserker icon in each. We have the obligatory three Chaos Spawn for those Blood Tithe generation points. And then we have four Chaos Rhinos. Alrighty, so the idea behind this list is to just go full ham on Berserkers. You've got the Lord Invocatus and the two big units of 10. They're going to be able to pre-game move and get into really powerful positions in the midboard. Meanwhile, you have four Rhinos, each of which containing two units of five Berserkers, Eviscerators everywhere, and then you've got the Chaos Spawn in addition for holding out your backfield, screening out, and also generating those sweet, sweet Blood Tithe points. I think this list is actually going to be a real sleeper and it's going to be really quite powerful. Those Berserkers fighting on death, those Berserkers being able to heroically intervene 6 inches and also putting out a ton of hurt, being MSU in nature so they're going to be generating a whole ton of blood tithe points and benefiting from those blood tithe points means that this army is going to be an absolute terrifying mountain to climb for your opponent and it's going to be a ton of fun to play. This is potentially one that I'm going to be running out straight out of the gate. However, we've got seven more lists to go through, and each one gets a little bit more exciting than the next. So let's jump into the second list. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of that first list is that it has no ranged firepower. So for this list, we're mixing it up a little bit. We're trying to create a little bit more of a balanced army, and we're going to be bringing in a classic favorite of the World Leaders players, and that is the Humble Land Raider. All right, so this list has Angron, the big bad himself. Then we have two units of five Corn Berserkers and another two units of five Corn Berserkers, so a total of four units of five. We then have two units of five Eight Bound, two units of Chaos Spawn, two Land Raiders, and two Rhinos. All right, so this list foregoes the Lord Invocatus for that pregame move. Instead, we've got Angron. He's there to be a beat stick, kill things, get killed, and then get resurrected and kill more things. That's what he's there to do. We have the two Land Raiders each of which is able to transport a unit of 5 8 bound, which means they're going to be able to disembark out that 11 inches because they gain that extra distance from the disembark move, and then they're going to be able to charge things doing massive amounts of damage. Meanwhile, the Land Raiders themselves are laying down firepower with those Soul Shadow Laz Cannons, and then you've got the Rhinos with the Berserkers in it, bringing up midfield support. All the while, you've got those couple of spawn holding your backfield and generating those Blood Tide points. One of the interesting things in the World Eaters Codex is that if you kill a vehicle, monster, or character, at the end of that phase, you generate an additional blood tithe point. So what you want to do is you want to try to kill some vehicles or monsters or characters in shooting, and then more in melee. Whereas if you kill both of them in the same phase, you're only going to generate one additional blood tithe point. So with that in mind, this list is pivoted a little bit more into the shooting to try to pop those vehicles early with those Soul Shadow Laz Cannons and pick up those kill points so that you can get those Blood Tithe points and you can really buff this army up. Alright, this next list is one that you've probably already seen floating around on the internet. I've seen this in several different sources and a lot of people have sent this list to me hoping that I would review it, so you're in luck. Uh, and this is one that people are raving about, which is going to be a top-tier World Eaters list. So let's have a look at the top-tier 8-bound themed list. 
So we have the Lord Invocatus, we have one, two, three, four, five units of five corn berserkers with an eviscerator in each and an icon. Then we have three units of five eight bound, three units of three exalted eight bound, three chaos spawn, and two rhinos. All right, so the idea behind this list is you're going to have the eight bound, which you're going to be able to pregame move with the extra movement from the Lord Invocatus, then turn one move again with additional move from the Lord Invocatus and get those really reliable turn one charges. Meanwhile, you're going to have two Rhinos, each with two units of Berserkers in it, moving up to control the midfield. The fifth unit of Berserkers is probably going to go into strategic reserve so that it can outflank and come onto this, you know, wherever it's needed. And then you're going to have your spawn in your backfield holding your objectives, generating blood type points. This is going to be a really powerful and oppressive army in certain matchups. However, there is one thing to note, and one of the reasons why I think this list might be a little bit overrated at the moment, is that a lot of armies are going to be able to prevent that turn one charge. All they need to do is put a line of guardsmen in front, and because 8-bound don't have the fly keyword, they're not going to be able to charge anything of relevance in that first turn, which means your opponent's just going to blow them off the table in their next turn. So there's definitely some considerations here around the Lord Invocatus 8-bound combo, which is why, as I said earlier, I'm more interested in that Rhino Rush version, where it's like you're not relying on that turn one charge, you're relying on having so many trading pieces that you're always gonna get the favorable trade and you're gonna grind your opponent out. So it's an interesting difference in the list. This list also has fewer units and therefore fewer blood type points and ability to generate fewer blood type points. So there's interesting considerations to be had there. That being said, in certain matchups, this list is gonna be absolutely insanely powerful when it does pull off those turn one charges into critical parts of your opponent's army. So it's definitely something to consider and it's definitely something that I think is going to leave a mark on the meta because people are going to have to start including things like the big units of Guardsmen so that they can protect from 8-bound. Because if you don't bring those elements and you do get paired into this 8-bound list, you're in for a very rough ride. So with that being said, let's jump into the next list, shall we? All right, this next list I call the Red Butchers, and it's going to lean on a few different elements in the Chaos book. It's going to also lean on some Forge World things. Now, it's worth noting at this point, a few of the lists coming up do include Imperial Army units, which at release will not be legal choices because the Forge World units will not have the appropriate keywords. However, given that they've been FAQ'd to go 4,000 Sons and Death Guard, it's very reasonable to expect that these will be FAQ'd to be legal for World Leaders. If you're attending an event anytime soon and this hasn't been FAQ'd, just reach out to the TO and see what they have to say because it's well within the TO's power to be like, well, of course you can take a Dreadclaw or of course you can take a Contempted Dreadnought in your World Leaders. However, rules as written, as it stands, it will not be a legal choice. But with that being said, let's get into the list, assuming that it does get FAQ'd or approved by a TO. All right, so this list is led by a Lord Invocatus. We have two units of 10 Corn Berserkers, two units of five eight bound, three units of five Terminators, two of which contain a Chain Fist, three units of Chaos Spawn, and then two Terex Pattern Termite Drills. Alrighty, so the idea behind this list is that you're going to be able to put those Berserkers in the ter Termite Drills, and they're going to be able to come on from Deep Strike, and they're going to be able to charge out of those Termite Drills, which will be very, very powerful, especially after your opponent has just wasted all of their screening potential trying to block out the 8-bound Invocatus combo. So being able to go, cool, we're sending in a missile of 8-bound turn 1, then turn 2, we're sending in two drills. Those drills also have melter guns on the front of them, which is why I've chosen them over the Dreadclaw, because they're going to be able to do damage in the shooting phase. And like we said earlier, being able to blow up vehicles in the shooting phase is really advantageous in terms of blood tithe point generation. So it's a bit of a mixed bag list, and then we have the Terminators, and the idea behind them is they will be able to move up into the center of the table as well and hold it. They're quite tough. They're one of the toughest units available to the world leaders. So you get them in cover, out of line of sight, make it hard for your opponent to deal with them. And anything that does come near them is going to get ripped apart. And it also means that you're going to be able to spam the fuck out of that Red Butcher's stratagem. Getting that Chain Fist up to four damage when hitting in vehicles is going to make it terrifying. That little unit of five Terminators is going to be able to do unreasonable amounts of damage when buffed. So the combination of the eight bound bomb, the drill bomb, the terminators holding the midfield, the spawn holding the backfield is gonna be a really wicked combo. So I look forward to seeing this list in events. 
All right, we're gonna mix it up a little bit here. And this list is a little bit less serious, a little bit more meme and a little bit more fun. And I call it Raining Hell. All right, so for this list, we have the Lord Invocatus. We have a World Eater's Lord on Juggernaut. We have two units of 10 Corn Berserkers. Then we have three Hellbrutes or Heckbrutes, if you will, with multi-melters. And then we have three Contemptor Dreadnoughts, also with multi-melters and a Hellforged Dreadnought Chain Fist. And then we round the list out with three Dread Claws. All right, this list actually has a surprising amount of versatility because you've got those three Dread Claws and they could house any combination of units. You could put the Contemptor Dreadnoughts in there and drop them turn one, getting those multi-melter shots and then rolling for those charges. Meanwhile, pre-game moving up your Corn Berserker units with the Lord Invocatus, or you could switch it up and you could pre-game move your Contempted Dreadnoughts, which also have the core keyword, and then you could put your Berserkers in the Dread Claws. So this versatility allows you to pick which one of these tools is going to be most effective against which enemy unit or enemy combination, and then wield them as such. So anytime you have diversity in your playstyle, it's always an advantage because one of the challenges with really obviously telegraphed you know, game plans is your opponent can play around them. If your only thing that can do the damage turn one is the eight bound, people are gonna play around them. Whereas if you have multiple different things that can be wielded in multiple different ways, such as the Dread Claws, which could contain either Berserkers or Contemptors, then that gives you a lot of versatility and it makes it very difficult for your opponent to predict your plan and then counter it. All right, this next list is one that I fantasized about the second I saw that we were getting a new Angron model, and I call this list the Greater Demon Kin. All right, this one's got very few units compared to the others. However, it's still very interesting. You have Angron, you have a Demon Prince with wings, you have three units of five eight bound, you have three units of three exalted eight bound, and then you have a Demon Patrol Detachment with Scarbrand and a unit of 10 Bloodletters. All right, so this list is themed around just being hyper elite. You've got all of the eight bound, you've maxed it out. You've got big units, you've got lots of units of eight bound. Meanwhile, you've got Angron and Scarbrand. Now, really interestingly, both of those have an aura of plus one attack. So if you put both of those down and then the eight bound in front of them, there is nothing that those eight bound will not rip to shreds. They are going to be super powerful. Further to that, you have two sources of preventing your opponent from falling back. You have two sources of Warp Locus, which means that you can bring in those Blood Letters, or you could maybe throw Angron up, use Angron to bring in Scarbrand, and then next turn, use Scarbrand to bring in the Blood Letters. You can do some really crazy stuff with these combos. So this one's really high concentrated damage. And one of the things I like about concentrated damage, and by that I mean single units or single models, that do huge amounts of damage, as opposed to having tons and tons of units, each of which do a smaller amount of damage, is that it's really hard for your opponent to get around it because they can't CP interrupt you when you're hitting them with Angron and Angron's just gonna kill whatever he touches, you know? Whereas if you're hitting him with three units of Berserkers in order to kill that thing, you fight with the first one and then they can interrupt and kill the others. So concentrated damage is also you know, it's just really effective, really efficient, and really reliable. And this has a lot of that. It has a lot of overlaying combos as well. Angron being able to turn off um, objective secured is gonna be really, really powerful in this list. And this list you would run as the Disciples of the Red Angels so that all of those eight bound are gonna get the objective secured keyword. And you're also gonna be able to buff one of them up with the eight bound exclusive upgrade available to the uh, Disciples of the Red Angels. So. Yeah, I think this list is really interesting, and it also would just be a ton of fun to play when you've got these two big scary monsters running around just doing massive amounts of damage. Meanwhile, you've got all these eight bound little sick models. I think this one would be really fun, and it would look sick on the tabletop as well. So let's get into the next list. Alrighty, this next list is one that I've fantasized about since I was like 12 years old, I want to say, when I very first got into Warhammer 40k. I remember seeing the old school Juggernaut Lord and the idea of having Berserkers on Juggernauts just was so amazing to me. So as soon as this codex came out, I was disappointed that we didn't get them. However, we do have the ability to run Blood Crushers from the Demons Codex in with our World Eaters. And we also have 
multiple data sheets in the Lord Invocatus and the World Leaders Lord on Juggernaut. So we can actually run a cavalry themed World Leaders Corn Demons hybrid army. So let's get into this list and see what it looks like. All right, so for this list, you have the Lord Invocatus, you have three World Leader Lords on Juggernauts, you have three units of five eight bound, you have three units of three exalted eight bound, then you have a Skull Master on Juggernaut, a unit of 10 blood letters, and a unit of five blood crushers. So that's five characters all riding Juggernauts. You've got the Lord Invocatus, you have three Chaos Lords on Juggernaut, and then you have the Skull Master, which is the demon riding the Juggernauts. So you have five characters on Juggernauts, and then you have a squad of five Juggernauts. So that's a big 10-man strong cavalry army, and then you support that with a whole bunch of eight bound, running around doing massive amounts of damage, holding objectives, making a real pain in the neck for your opponent. This is probably of the lists that I've listed so far, one of the least powerful, but God, it's cool. Guys riding juggernauts are so sick. I think this list would look amazing on the tabletop and I would really like to play it myself. I might even bring it to an RTT that I've got coming up in a couple of weeks, just so that I can get those juggernauts on the table and just really enjoy the idea of trampling my opponent to death. All right, this next list has a really interesting combo in it, and I call this list the Gore Master. And basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be taking Abaddon the Despoiler in our World Eaters list. Now it's a little bit technical the way that this is achieved. Basically, Abaddon has the corn faction keyword, and he gets Agent of Chaos if he's your Warlord. So what you basically do is you take Abaddon as your Warlord, you put him in a Legionis Demonica detachment that's a patrol. Now. Legionus Demonica Detachments, as long as they contain less than 25% of your power level, they also gain the Agents of Chaos keyword. And it specifies that a Legionus Demonica Detachment is one that contains only Legionus Demonica units or units with the Agent of Chaos rule. So because Abaddon has the Agents of Chaos rule, he is a legal choice within a Legionus Demonica Detachment. And then because they would then all have Agents of Chaos, they are a legal choice in your uh, world Eaters Arcs of Omen combo, and you don't lose your Blood Tithe, you don't lose any of your benefits. So that's basically how this list is going to work, but let's break down what units are included in the list, and then I'm going to talk about why it's important to get Abaddon the Despoiler in a World Eaters list. So for our HQ, we have a World Eaters Demon Prince with wings, we have a unit of 9 Corn Berserkers, we have a unit of 10 Corn Berserkers, we have 2 units of 5 Corn Berserkers, then we have 2 Chaos Rhinos, three Chaos Spawn, two Terex Pattern Termite Drills, and then we have our Allied Detachment, which has Abaddon the Despoiler, a unit of Blood Lettuce, and a unit of Flesh Hounds. So as for units, it's very similar to what we've discussed in previous lists. The big change here is that we have Abaddon the Despoiler. Now the reason he's so powerful is because he has an aura of plus one to charge rolls. So what's gonna happen here is basically you're going to have Abaddon giving an aura of plus one to charge, then you spend Blood Tithe points, which is going to give all of your World Eaters a further plus one to their charge. So when those Berserkers come out of that Termite Drill, they're getting plus two to their charge, inches, uh, charge range, which means you need to roll seven on the dice to make a charge. Then you're going to be able to spend a Command Point because they have an Icon to get a 3d6 drop the lowest. So now you're rolling three dice, discarding the lowest, adding two to that result, and going in for the charge. And if you combine that with the ability to command point reroll, if you fail, it's beyond a 99% chance that you're going to make that charge from that deep strike reserve. So your, your uh, drill comes up, your berserkers disembark, and it's almost a guarantee that they will make the charge. Especially when you factor in that if they do fail, you're probably going to have a second drill coming up, which can do the same thing. You won't be able to use all of the stratagems, but they are still going to get the plus two to their charges, provided all your auras are correct. Really, really powerful. So being able to send this in and just get almost guaranteed charges is so good because the thing with uh, charging from Deep Strike is even if you go, cool, I've got an 8, 90% chance of making it, right? That sounds really, really good. But when you think about it, over the cross course of a five-game event, you're going to be making what? Say you make seven or eight charges per game. So you're making, you know, 30 plus, 40 plus charges throughout the game. If you only have a 90% success rate, that's gonna be like four or five charges that you're going to fail 
and they very well could have been charges that are going to cost you games. So being able to just go, you know what, I have a 99% chance of making these charges and I can choose when I do that. I can choose when I'm going to use the stratagems. I can choose when I'm going to spend the blood tithe points to get the plus one to charge. I can choose where Abaddon arrives from Deep Strike or where he moves up onto the table so that I can make those charges. Being able to just say this charge that I want is definitely going to succeed means that your army is way harder to defeat. I know a lot of Sisters of Battle players that swear by Miracle Dice for this exact reason. Being able to just go, cool, I've got a six and a four, so I'll on my Miracle Dice. They just know for a fact that when they bring in those Zephyrim or the Repenture or whatever they have, they just know for a fact that that charge is going to succeed, which means they can plan for it to succeed and have it never disappoint them. It's such a powerful mechanic, and World Eaters got a version of it if you bring Abbott onto the list. Now, it is worth noting at this point that if you don't bring Abaddon, you still get the 3d6 discard the lowest, you still get plus one from the Blood Tithe, and you still have the ability to command point and reroll that. So it's still in the high 90s, it's around 97 to 98% without Abaddon. So if you're not interested in running Abaddon because you think it breaks the narrative, or you think it's a little bit too cheesy, which I completely respect and understand, if you don't want to run Abaddon, you can still run this list very similarly, but with those combos in mind, just without the plus one to charge from Abaddon. It's just if you really want to dial it up to the next level, you can run Abaddon, and he himself is an amazing beat stick that's going to be generating you blood tithe all game anyway, because he's going to be killing anything he touches. So that's my final of my eight lists. So let me know in the comments below which one of these lists was your favorite, because I'll be planning a series of battle reports coming up. I'm just waiting for my eight bound to arrive so that I can get them painted. I've got Adrian Strath from Iron Wolf Painting. He's doing up an Angron for me. It's going to look fucking schmick. So we're going to be doing a whole bunch of battle reports when I get my hands on these new minis. But until then, let's talk. Let's workshop these lists. Let's come up with some stuff that you guys think is going to be really interesting to see on the tabletop. And then I'll wield it for you and we'll talk about it. We'll develop this list. We'll you know, continue to progress going forward. I'll start running World Eaters at tournaments, giving that feedback to you guys. And let's really deep dive this faction. I think a lot of people have discarded it out of hand early because they're like, oh, it doesn't have any shooting, or oh, it's not that good at this, or oh, it's, you know, the blood tide's not that good, or the units are too expensive, or whatever. But I do think that there is some power buried in there somewhere. It might take us a while to dig it out, but there's definitely some combos in this book. Things like being able to fight on death for berserkers is so freaking good for one command point because it just means that you can throw two units in. You know, if they're going to fight here, you go, cool, well, I'm going to. Spend CP to fight on death here after they fight. So, boop, fight there. And now, before they activate their next unit, I'm going to spend two command points to CP interrupt and fight there, which means you are getting to fight with both units, you know. Even if you charge something that's going to make you fight last, you can still reliably just charge into it, spend a CP to fight on death. They make you fight last. They kill you, but you kill them as well, you know. Those sorts of interactions are so freaking powerful. And they really go a long way to fixing the problems with the World Eaters. Even things like being able to heroically intervene six inches, which means that those Corn Berserkers can be out of line of sight, hiding on an objective somewhere. And there's no way that your opponent can touch that objective in any way without the World Eaters charging them, you know, essentially charging them. Because if they move in and you heroically intervene, well, neither of those units made a charge move this turn, which means you get to choose the order of operations as the defending player which means you're going to fight before them and wipe them off the objective before they get to do anything. So really, really powerful combos. And then on top of that, we have some absolutely bonkers secondary objectives. Sacrificing blood tithe points just to get victory points is really reliable and there's nothing your opponent can do to stop you. The one where you soak objective markers in blood, that's really powerful because you want to be on the objective markers anyway and killing things that started the battle round on an objective marker is generally what you're going to be doing anyway. So you don't really have to think about it. Just play the game, just kill things, just run around like a maniac and you'll be racking up massive amounts of victory points. There's some seriously cool combos in here and I'm really excited for what the World Eaters Codex is going to bring over the next four months before we get 10th edition. So uh, I hope to take you along on that journey and uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Another quick, huge shout out to my Patreon supporters. You can pick up apparel like this if you want to show your support as well. Uh, we also do neoprene objective markers. We've just sold out of our Patreon exclusive dice, but I do have more on the way in a new, very exciting design. So uh, yeah, with that being said, I'm going to end the video here. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.
dog than the black god. Warhammer community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world, especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor a mad cunt like Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel, unsustainable, and your fault.